um, so if you know, if you remember, back in 2018, Monique had a bit of a spat with Netflix. I think she was trying to get her Netflix special picked up. And of course, as you guys might have seen, Netflix has become like the number one provider of um, comedy specials. Um, usually, It used to be HBO, it used to be Comedy Central, um, sometimes it used to be even Showtime. But now it's kind of uh, steered towards the direction of Netflix. Netflix has kind of picked up loads of big, um, big ticket acts, such as, you know... Um, Jerry Seinfeld and Dave Chappelle, Chris Rock has signed kind of multi special comedy special deals that have kind of really racked up the numbers and really taken, uh, you know, the money that money is kind of taking the money comedians can earn for their comedy specials to way new heights. Right. So they're kind of the, the big boy in town. So for the most part, comedians have kind of seen getting a Netflix special or being approved on there as a bit of a badge of honor. But of course, because the floodgates opened, everyone rushed in. So now it's kind of oversaturated to, to the most part. And the way the algorithm works or the way the marketing budget works there, depending on, I don't know how they do it. Some people don't get featured on the front page and it's hard to kind of find comedy specials unless you're some of the bigger names like Sebastian Manasako and all those other people. They don't really get featured on the main page. So sometimes, so there's been a conversation happening now in the comedy space, whether or not Netflix is actually a good place to go to because, you know, I'm assuming when you put your special up on Netflix, they have an exclusivity deal where they might hold it for a certain X amount of months, X amount of years. Um, you get you might get lost in the source no one probably see it and the idea of a comedy special isn't to make money on it really for the most part the idea of a comedy special um, is akin to playing i'd assume a set for boiler room or something along those kind of lines you use it as a business card to get yourself out there right it's sort of like an, a, a a performance cv to people can see oh this is how funny you are because it's like a collection of your best jokes throughout the year or throughout the last couple of years that you've collated and kind of summarized into a one hour special and you use that as a way to kind of leverage other opportunities in the future so which is what i've heard right i've not really heard people i've not really heard the whole like comedy special is a great money owner until maybe the louis ck thing where he started selling it direct to consumer that's the only time where i really heard people making big bank on comedy specials again maybe i'm, I'm naive i don't know maybe comedy albums make more money but from what i understand they were that's how they were kind of viewed and that's how it's kind of going back to anyway fast um going back to monique monique is obviously a big comedian somebody that came up through the whole like death comedy jam um circuit and kind of sprung up from there and leveraged her opportunities there into different avenues she decided to start negotiating with netflix and unfortunately netflix didn't offer her the valuation that she wanted that she expected and like most celebrities or most people are a public guy who have an issue with something she decided to go to social media was it social media or this or she did she do on social media or someone film her uh, comedy night? I'm not sure what happened, but anyway, she she aired her grievances um, about the fact that, you know, she was only offered $500,000 and Amy Schumer, who's less funny, who she thinks she's less funny, who thinks she's more funny than and has more experience than, was offered more. Then, you know, there was loads of commentary online about, you know, uh, there was a lot of debate online about it, whether or not uh, Monique was kind of underestimating the, in the cultural influ the the relevancy, you'd say, maybe relevancy the kind of immediate relevancy of an Amy Schumer, maybe, you know, to the general public, Amy Schumer is more famous than than Monique, so maybe that might make sense. Maybe the offer was because Netflix people weren't really familiar with who Monique was, blah, blah, blah. But the general consensus it kind of felt like was that Monique kind of went about it the wrong way because then she started going on this campaign to get everyone to kind of boycott Netflix, which obviously, you know, people weren't going to do because they didn't really understand why she was complaining in the first place, which kind of, you know, goes back to what, what the issue was, right? She wasn't necessarily clear what the issue was, why it happened, why it transpired. And of course, because of, cause she was shouting and, you know, disparaging people's names, people on the other side were trying to, were leaking information to kind of discredit her and they were leaking information that she was difficult to work with, that she was a bit of a pain in the ass, which is why people didn't want to vouch for her because you know it the silence from the kind of like the black hollywood glitterati was whether it was um tyler perry oprah and a few others was quite deafening right no one came up to kind of back her and the general consensus was reading between lines was that people were thinking that she was wilding out right she was going about things the wrong way and i was going to play the game but she didn't want to play it um and again that that goes back to her being um trying to have integrity right trying to stay steadfast in her position like no they offered me a derisory offer. I'm going to stand, I'm standing against it. If you guys are going to keep quiet, I'm not going to keep quiet. So it rumbled, rumbled, rumbled on. And it kind of, it kind of went, it kind of went away. It felt like, right. But then thinking about it, it went away, but maybe it went away because no one picked it up. Eventually, I'm assuming the, the deal probably got taken back, right? The perfected deal they sent her. Netflix probably rescinded it. I assume wherever she went after that, she was probably trying to match the same money and no one else was offering it or no one else was able to give it to her. And essentially, she kind of got blackboard, right, from the industry because you didn't... Usually, I've heard people say in the entertainment industry, if you haven't seen an actor or an actress on screen, 
it's because people don't like to work with them, usually for the most part, right? If people like to work with you, then you see the person on screen a lot. If you don't see them a lot on screen, it's because they've done something that people don't, don't like or they just think they're a pain in the ass. So if you are a pain in the ass, the only way to kind of go around it is to just make yourself an island, right? It's to kind of have all the resources on your own team. It's to make yourself completely independent and just do things your own way. And in that way, no one can kind of effectively cancel you, blackball you. You're, kind of, you're basically your own machine. And it seems like Monique doesn't really have that possibility at the moment. So somehow, fast forward to now, she sits on the couch with Steve Harvey, who was obviously another person that she also felt didn't have her back or didn't have her corner. And they get into this debate that I kind of really, re I really kind of sympathise with both sides. And we're kind of going to speak a bit about what they speak about. But I sympathise I sympathize with Monique's side of things, where she kind of feels like her... The, her black Hollywood friends who kind of know what was going on, who knew the details of the actual deal uh, were being um, definitely silent about what happened. And also, um, I also sympathize with Steve Harvey in that maybe the way Monique kind of went about it wasn't the best way to go about it. And there are other ways to do it because it's essentially they're playing in somebody else's back garden, right? It's not their, it's not their platform. It's Netflix. They can do what they want effectively if they want to. But here's the, here's the kind of debate that kind of hots up in this place and we'll kind of go and speak on it on the other end. We can't cure darkness with more darkness. I got what we you. can do is cure it with comedy. And what I'm not gonna do, Steve, I'm never ever gonna waver from my comedy show on that stage. That's my gift and that's my freedom. And what happens is when you allow people to start taking your freedom and your gift and making it become what makes them comfortable, we then lose. When you called me with the morning show on the phone, I said to you, Steve, I'm this. And y'all know I did nothing wrong. Y'all know my husband did nothing wrong. But none of y'all in real time, in real time, was strong enough to go publicly and say, we can't throw our sister under the bus. Because Mo, listen to me. But again, I understand that sentiment, sentiment and I get where she's coming from and I get that kind of frustration. But I think... There needs to be an acknowledgement in some cases or in most cases that not everyone's going to do things the way you want them to be done. Um, and some people have other things at stake that they're more likely, that they're more worried about than protecting a fellow um, entertainer, a fellow comedian. There are other things that are at the top of their priority. Number one, being their own survival. Number two, being the safety of their family. Like that's essentially it. And I think for those of us who are, um, in, in integrity centric or you know put integrity up on a pedestal I think that's the defining factor that makes you the person that you are I think it needs to be understanding that that might be your perspective it's not everyone else's perspective and I think that's something I've had to grow that's something that's I've, I've had to kind of really come to grips with over the years because I was I could I wouldn't say blackboard would you say blackboard not blackboard I'd say I was probably ousted or let's say left aside from a scene that i was part of for a long time and i could have easily um built up resentment or built up ideas of you know envy or hate whatever it may be about certain people about how, what they've done and you know i could have been jealous that certain people that i was in the industry with kind of went up and kind of had these kind of on paper amazing jobs and doing great things and are working and doing their own stuff whatever but i think i knew as soon as i took the step out and I kind of stepped away from that scene and I wasn't an active member and I wasn't um, rubbing shoulders with the right people. I knew what that effect would have in my career. I knew the cost that I, it was going to bring towards me. And I knew that it was a cost I was willing to take because I wasn't really enjoying myself, right? I wasn't necessarily comfortable with what was necessary. Was what, I wasn't comfortable doing what was needed in order to kind of pers get myself forward, get myself ahead of the pack or do what I need to do or advance my career. I'm not saying what they're doing is right or wrong, but I just know I couldn't do it, right? So because of that, I just thought, you know what? Instead of being the grumpy guy in the corner of the room, bemoaning how it was better back in the day, I'm just going to step away completely and let these guys enjoy themselves because they're obviously having a blast. Even if they're not having a blast, they look like they're having a good time. And I'm, not, and I'm looking like I'm not having a good time, so I step away. But I didn't hold resentment. I didn't, I didn't feel like they owed me anything. I didn't feel like they should have spoken up for me. I didn't feel like they should have included me in things because I was around. I wasn't there. Um, they didn't see me. I didn't speak to them. Um, I didn't really care what they were doing. They didn't care what I was doing. So, you know, it is, it is what it is. And I just think we all get to play different roles in life. And I think that's my role. That's their role. And I think in general, we all kind of like, in the end, we all kind of um, add to the end product. We're the ones kind of, it, it all comes funneling back to the same thing. I'd assume so. I'd assume so.
But it continues. We fighting two wars here. What war? We, there's two wars. It's what your issue is, and it's what the perception of the issue is, and the narrative has changed. See, I'm hearing what you're no, saying, no. baby, and I agree with it when the narrative changes. But if all of y'all said, this is the only issue I have with it, baby, when all of y'all said privately, to include Oprah, all of y'all said privately, we, I've done nothing wrong. When you tell the truth, you have to deal with the repercussions of the truth. We black out here. We can't... Which is something super true and really kind of harsh to hear, right? When you tell the truth, you have to deal with repercussions of the truth. Now, it could sound like Ty Steve Harvey's selling out. It could sound like he's, like, advocating for um, playing to the man and not backing your friends in public because you're worried about your pocket. But that's the truth of the matter. We're living in the streaming era where there's so much money on the table, right? People's integrity, people's loyalty, people's friendship is really getting tested because with so much money on the table, what it generally means is that the power was centralized around, let's say, three or four big um, corporate entities, media platforms for the most part. They control everything. So if you, if you, if you go against them, if you kind of put bent, if you put the wrong nose in, out of shape in those places, essentially they can they can if they want to cancel your whole career but on the flip side the best thing about this industry at this time we're living in now is that we're also living in the internet age where if you're able to build up a following build up a build a platform um produce content uh distribute it to the right people get it in front of the right eyes you can essentially circumnavigate all of that stuff and be on your own island you don't need a gatekeeper but if you want to play the gatekeeper game you want to have your thing on streaming platforms. You want to be able to go on these talk shows and all that sort of stuff. You have to, you have to, have to, have to play the game. And playing the game means understanding what people think of you, what actually is going on and what you're going to do about how you're going to go about it. And maybe Monique just didn't get how to go about it the right way. And again, I sympathize with her because like I said before in the beginning, the Britain Dawn situation is a good example. Most of the time, the only way to kind of really get a response from these people is to attack them online. They don't care about negoti negotiating in private. It's protracted. It's long. It's drawn out. You have to go through millions of different people. But the moment you get your phone out and you start recording yourself, at home, online, just being honest and talking directly to the camera and sharing your thoughts and opinions and what's going on and your missteps and what they've put, put up on is the moment you instantly get a reply. How many times have you gone to a restaurant, had really shitty service and then got on Twitter and complained about it and you got offered a gift card? Happens all the time, right? But if you if you kind of spoke to them in person or try to contact them after the fact directly via the email, it'd be a long drawn out process. But most of these places don't like their reputation to get tarnished online or in public. So they'd much rather... They'd much rather, they'd much rather you not go online and disparage them. That's the only way to get, get, get their attention. So I have some of you even for Monique in that regard a little bit. Come out here and do it any kind of way we want to. Let me, Listen oh, to me. Your husband yes. can't be the Sydney that he really is out here. Let me tell you They're something. Not fit, that flexing, Let me we got to flex something. a different way. We Let out me. here in a game. This the money game. This ain't the black man's game. This ain't the white man's game. It's this the is the money, money game. game. But I, I'm We're in the money something. game. And We're you cannot sacrifice game. yourself. The we best are. thing you can do for this poor people is not be brother. one of them. You cannot We're help them. We're in the money home. game. But let me tell you what the game is for the money game. Which is another brutal thing. The, you can't help poor people if you're one of them. That's a brutal thing, but it's true. If you're, the minor, if you're in a minority and there's not many of us, or even in, I guess, in the US, in the entertainment industry, it's probably not many of them either, even though the influence is far reaching. Um, the only way you can assert power, the only way, not power, the only way you can assert influence is to build up wealth. And with wealth, you then can build, you know, various different network, network or networks or DSPs or, you know, digital streaming platforms, whatever they may be. You may build up different organizations that can then bring the power in-house, right? Bring it back to the community. That's the kind of overarching goal, it seems, that like for most of these uh, black American entertainers, right? They have understand they understand their influence. They understand how much cultural relevance they have. They understand how much attention they can garner. And now they're trying to bring all of that power, all of that influence, all of that infrastructure back inside the community, right? They're trying to get it all back in-house. Um, but of course, with that, it means you have to circumnavigate these kind of dicey waters right you have to kind of play the game on both ends but then you have to realize that in the end it's not a personal thing it's just where the money lies where the money lies is where decision makers decisions get made because whoever's deal whoever's kind of approving the checks is trying to keep a job whoever's trying to you know scout the talent is trying to keep a job so the one thing that they don't want to do is get people upset 
in the wrong places. So you kind of have to play both games on both ends. I understand what Steve Harvey's saying. Like this. Before the money game, it's called the integrity game. And we've lost the integrity worrying about the money. But Mo, and wait a minute, if wait I a minute. crumble, if you my crumble, children crumble, my grandchildren crumble, I cannot, for the sake of my integrity, stand up here and let everybody that's counting on me crumble so I can make a statement. There are ways to win the war in a different way. Which I, which I again completely agree with. I think I'm gonna take this video off and talk about it. Um, I think that's that's essentially why I agree with. I think, and this only comes with maturity. This only comes with age. This only comes with experience. I think having dealt with the system on my end as well in another in the job I had at Nike as well, I, I kind of dealt through that kind of you know system where there was a particular system in place where you could win the right where you could win their way or win your way. No, you couldn't win, couldn't you win your way. You can only win their way, to be honest. But there was a game that you had to play that I wasn't necessarily able to play or willing to play. And I knew that there was going to be a consequence for it, right? And that consequence was eventually I lost my job, right? Eventually um, I got let go along with a few other people. But I know specifically in my case, there was an opportunity for me to kind of grow, to kind of still stay there, still kind of be there working at that company. But it would mean I have to do some things. And I didn't want to do those things. Um, but again, there's a price that you pay for it and then you have to know that you can maybe come back around it around the other side you can build yourself up outside of there become a person of influences outside the circle and then they can kind of bring you back in and ask you to consult which is going to be you know a great thing for your ego but all in all there's different games to play different roles that we all have to play in that game but again it, it, your hope is that it all kind of feeds back into the same lane right we all kind of get reap the benefits of this by seeing that you know for so the powers that be can see that um, a monique does exist someone that is unrelenting somebody that is kind of gonna say how it is right and talk shit and whatever it may be there is somebody like her out there and there's also someone like steve harvey who's willing to kind of you know play the game somewhat and be cooperative in the background even though they're making their plays well on the side i think the powers that be need to see that there's these dissenting voices that are working underneath the same roof, but are also able to be cordial. And that's what I like about this conversation. It gets quite testy, it gets quite heated, but at the end of the day, they're, they're friends and they're trying to get, they're trying, to, they, they want the best for each other, right? Um, Steve Harvey wants, doesn't want her to be blackboard and Monique obviously wants Steve Harvey to see what, what, how she sees things. So it's a really good debate, really good um, discussion. I recommend you check it out. I'll actually put the link in the show notes for those of you that want to watch the whole thing, but I recommend you watch the whole thing.